We love you. All right, guys. Hey, everyone. So uh, we're here to talk uh, what Web3 projects need to know about Web2 cybersecurity. Uh, and, and really, I think this is going to be a great uh, kind of follow-on talk uh, to the Bridge uh, Security Framework talk that Patrick just gave. Um, this is kind of the complement, right? So he went over really some of the smart contract and protocol layer aspects of Bridge security. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of bridges have been hacked, though, not from you know the hardcore cryptography, but from basics, from cybersecurity basics. Okay, the cybersecurity basics matter. They matter because they have geopolitical significance. So, before we get started on the panel, take a look on the screen. There was a great article by CNET that came out a couple days ago, and it really talked about how Lazarus, Lazarus Group, uh, which is affiliated with North Korea, uh, is seeking to infiltrate this ecosystem by setting up front companies and then having uh, uh, applicants, job applicants, apply to these front companies and then the engineers get fished, right? And that's actually how the uh, Ronin Bridge attack happened, okay? Uh, so the fundamentals matter and it doesn't just impact the people in this room, the people at this conference, it impacts geopolitics because then it funds things like North Korea's nuke program or you know, transnational criminal organizations and, and stuff of that nature. Okay, so what do we need to take away from this panel? So a lot of fundamentals from the last two to three decades of Web2 cybersecurity. There's cloud security risks that we have to understand and mitigate. Couple with that, there's front-end security risks, right? Um, there's operational security risks. There's also corporate security risks. And then obviously, big topic with some of these bridge hacks has been key management, uh, endpoint detection and response, and um, Again, management of individual, individual nodes and validators. Um, doesn't mean we need to discount smart contract security risk. What it means, though, is we need to shift the security conversation in this space from very siloed you know, individual audits to a holistic end-to-end -end scope of the project's entire architecture, right? And not just their technical architecture, but the people architecture. And that's something that, you know, we have some newer entrepreneurs in the space, um, and that's something that as we kind of get some battle scars as an ecosystem, I think we're going to learn time and time again. Okay, so who are the panelists? Um, let's start left to right. We got, uh, I guess, we'll start over there. Uh, Nassim from A16Z Crypto. We have Taylor from, from MetaMask. We have Corey from OpenSea. Special guest Hudson from Crypto Twitter. <laughs> and then another special guest, Mudit from also from Crypto Twitter. Oops, no, Polygon, Polygon says that. <laughs> cool. All right, guys, so we'll start um, with kind of a, a basic question, and I'll ask it to Nas first and then the rest of the panel. Um, Nas, if you could kind of describe, you know, from the context of a, of a just normal Web3 or like a, you know, representative Web3 project in, in the ecosystem, what are the Web 2 parts of, of their tech stack? And then what are the Web 3 parts of the, of the tech stack? And then what are the security relevant parts of, of each? Okay, I actually feel like it's a, it's a fairly uh, long answer that is required for that. But you know, we, we do spend kind of quite a bit of time going from the early days of the company up until kind of like the ongoing updates to um, you know, decentralized protocols. I would say that, um, you know, it kind of like starts with the people. It's essentially just like a, a set of people who just want to, you know, design a component, uh, build it, uh, deploy it, make it available, and just like maintain it over time. So there is kind of like the everything that it, that it encompasses. So that means, you know, you essentially start in introducing devices to build the components on. You start in involving kind of like the entire kind of like, you know, secure, software development lifecycle that is relevant to every single person kind of like building uh, technology in general. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to cover, cover like anything that is, you know, kind of like common to what to end, what to hear. Um, so you're going to have like this part then, you know, this, these people need to build an organization, right? And like with that come, you know, kind of like corporate security, um, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, kind of like any, anything, you know, from like an endpoint, uh, you know, 
security standpoint, device security, and, and, and so on. Um, I would say that the, like, the AppSec is also like very, uh, very similar, you know, always kind of like, you know, analysis of your code as you kind of like develop it and, and obviously you want to iterate uh, pretty fast so you're gonna build your CI, you're gonna integrate, you're gonna run, you know, security testing and bone scanning and all the, the stuff that we all, all know and love. Um, doesn't really matter whether you're building for Web 2 or Web 3 at, at this point, right? Um, I think that, yeah, like in my, in my mind, everything that, that spans over, you know, network security, um, essentially like network security, uh, corporate security, AppSec, security engineering, key management. And by the way, like the key management is a part that is like highly overlooked. Like a lot of people think like, okay, it's okay. I can deal with this later, you know? I'm just gonna have like, you know, like a single key on like a either ledger or like some, you know, uh, uh, fairly not robust, you know, key, key storage. And then kind of like push it out to, uh, to later. But, you know, key management is like a fairly complex thing that like we have to deal with in, in Web2. Um, yeah, I would, think, I would say that like these are probably like the, 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 the majority of the things that we see. And obviously, you know, comes with like, you know, physical security. I think that like it kind of like ties into, you know, key management and the security of the people as well. Um, because it's not just about the funds, it's also... On, on that note, we've okay. uh, heard stories of people walking around uh, certain places with, you know, crypto swag and exactly. having their phones out and so on. So that probably ties into this exactly. as well, right? Um, yeah, and we had like uh, quite a few conversations actually with, uh, you know, various teams of our portfolio that were coming here. And, you know, because decentralization is a spectrum and like you try to kind of like start obviously centralized with like just very few people and kind of like, you know, decentralize over time. Uh, there is like a point in time and we're probably at this point in time like right now where uh, any person that kind of uh, gets hacked, attacked like physically can kind of like result in either assets getting in trouble or even like reputational, you know, damages that can be created as well. Or potentially physical access. Or physical access to as well. company or exactly. protocol. And so I assets, think that, yeah. Uh, yeah, the reputational damages actually is something that like is, is highly overlooked as well. It's not just about your protocol. It's like, you know, uh, everything that comes around that. Do you guys have your stuff squared away or not effectively? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Anyone else on the panel? Um, go, go ahead. So when I think about Web 2 versus Web 3 security, especially right now how early we are with Web 3 and Ethereum and blockchain, there is going to be a need for Web 2 stuff in your stack. Uh, not even consumer facing necessarily, but like who here actually like doesn't run their project on GitHub and uses something like Mattermost instead of Discord or Slack or other non-hosted. You're awesome, whoever that one guy in the back is. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, good, good for you. But if you're, unless you're doing that, like you really need to be very, very careful about where your data is going and keep up with that. Uh, something else is that I think is overlooked a lot, especially when with Web3 and how open it is and how it, open it is to contribute, are two things. Uh, watching your GitHub uh, to make sure that the you know PRs that are being put in uh, are actually from your team members that you trust and that you vetted. Uh, Sushi Swap had a bad incident where someone joined their joined their team and then put something in that like I think stole keys or something at the, on their web page. Insider threat. Yeah, insider threat basically. Yep. We'll talk and about then, that. And then secondly, um, this is something I worked at the Ethereum Foundation as the org security lead for three years. And something I learned, especially as I was leaving and hadn't reflected back on, there were just a handful, maybe two people in the organization that had master access to just about everything. And that's incredibly bad. Uh, it's even, it was even worse earlier, so just <laughs> like, like, bear with like, me. Yeah, like, like what happens if those people get run over by a bus, right? Uh, not even that. They could literally take down the Ethereum website, post yeah. on the Ethereum official Twitter, post on the YouTube, pretend that Vitalik died. Crash yep. the market. Like yep. there's, a, there's like a lot of and things. And there's a monetary incentive there. And there's a monetary incentive. Everyone has a price, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, if it wasn't that we just really liked and trusted the people doing it, like we got lucky, but really there should be different ways. And there's, you can look up ways that like people have theorized how to do this best for years. Separate the people who have access to the most critical parts of your organization and have an audit trail, have like a foolproof audit trail. They cannot wipe. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I think of, because it's like Web2 security seemingly has mastered this in some levels, but Web3, like, forgot about it. So that's what I think. <laughs> oh. So uh, on the sushi incident, first of all, glad we are not talking about the horse incident. But, uh, <laughs> Off limits. <laughs> yeah. 
offline the one that get, happened a while back. Um, so <laughs> what happened actually was one of the contractors had push access to the code base. Uh, there was no PR review approval process and it just got, uh, they like got angry with something, pushed malicious code, nobody noticed, it got pushed out. And the key takeaway from that is you should always manage access. Uh, people should only have access to things that they really need. Uh, in a production environment, no single person should have push access. Uh, it should always be approval based, have at least one or two reviews required. Uh, and expanding that further, uh, really like just minimize access to only things people really need. Uh, for example, like uh, access should not be considered as uh, like a pride or something. So uh, co-founders, for example, or founders of a company shouldn't really have access to critical things like your emails, uh, servers, or whatever, unless they are actually doing something of it. Just because they have a higher precedence or whatever doesn't mean they should have access. The thing is like, People in people are people, no matter what, people will get compromised one way or another. So you have to have that second layer of security where even if someone gets compromised, the impact is minimum. So a practical example in the Ronin case, uh, the bridge hack, their employee got compromised. That, that I can understand, like if someone, uh, a phishing attack, he was like, it was a very well orchestrated attack. So. Uh, I'll give it to him like, okay, sure. He got caught, but the issue there, main issue was that that one single employee had access to everything like that one single employee's access could have drained 600 million, which should not have happened in production. That was that, that was the key problem in that hack. Not that the phishing happened. That is gonna happen. You just have to protect from the impacts. Cool. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I'll just add that, um, I think. Uh, if you want to, you want to look at the different, uh, what's missing in the Web3 and versus Web2, is just look at the Web2 security org chart. Uh, you know, you have your incident response teams, you have your, uh, you have a corp sec group, you have a uh, production sec group, you have an app sec group, you have your uh, security reviewers, you have your vendor security audits, you have your, uh, you know, all those roles are there because that's how you achieve security. We just have Sam's son. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, yeah, not right now. But, but Sam doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sam doesn't scale, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and so I think, like, if you want to know what you're missing, like, look at the delta between your org chart and you know any any well established Web two company. So that, that's an interesting question. Then, so in, in the various life life side, like life phases of a crypto project, what needs to be internal versus external, right? So obviously, everyone goes out, gets an audit. It's kind of a commonplace thing. Um, I still love audits, right? I'm the co-founder of an auditing marketplace. So we love audits, but it's not the, the panacea. So I guess, Corey, to you first and the rest of the panel, like when do you need to hire an internal CISO? Uh, we're, we're starting to see later stage projects hire a CISO, but is this something where, you know, you raise venture money and then on your use of funds, like employee three is an internal CISO? Uh, well, uh, I have a bias that yes, that play, maybe playing two actually, but uh, yeah. you know, I think, I think an under underappreciated property of security is that it's uh, it is not something that's added on later. It is an emergent property of your design, and so if you don't start from the beginning thinking about security, you, you're not going to have security at the end. Uh, and I think that like so yes, I would I would argue that you should have them early. Sorry, yes, I would like 100% agree with that because. Um, Security is really about like the whole system and it's like the social system, it's a people system, it's, it's how you interact with your community, uh, it's how you hire, it's who you hire, it's how you vet them. Um, it literally touches like everything that you do. Um, and if any one piece is like not secure, that's an entry point. And the thing about specifically like these crazy hacking groups that are coming out of North Korea and other locations is that uh, let's say that they just get access to your Slack, right? So it's like your internal Slack, you got like 20 employees, right? They will then use that, just that access, and they will sit there for like literally months. And they will read everything that you do, and they will understand how you operate. Not creepy at all, by the way. It's super <laughs> crazy. Uh, and they will use the information they glean there to then like escalate to fish you, spear fish you via email, or spear fish you via Telegram, or LinkedIn DMs, or whatever they, whatever you use, they're gonna get you. And and they just, over the course of like months and even years, they'll just like keep going and going and going. Um, and so it's like these little things 
that we don't take seriously because you don't have anyone on your team early that's thinking about security, that is the problem, right? And the solution is not to get a freaking security audit. I'm sorry. I not, love security audits. No, no. To be but, clear, yeah, like, it, it's, a, it's a secondary check. Yeah. Audits are just a secondary check. Yeah. Audits are not going to solve your internal security problems for you. Projects have to solve that. Yeah. So. And if you, especially if you hire like a good security person early on, they will uh, indoctrinate your team as it grows and they will uh, design your team, right? Your org chart, your organization, your products, how you work, right? They will help design that from the get go. And therefore, every layer of your stack, as it gets bigger, um, as the responsibility gets spread out across more people, as you scale up, as the financial incentives get greater, you're, you're just going to be in a way better position. And I really cannot emphasize enough, like what Corey said, like you cannot add security on after. Like it's not a thing. You can't be like, oh yeah, we'll just be lazy now and then we'll like fix it later. That's not how it works. Like security is a core part of your entire organizational design, your product design, and your system design. make this a little spicy so Ooh, uh, let's go I think like these guys are just securing their jobs right now but <laughs> in terms of I mean to be to be fair we all are but you know, yeah. yeah but like just being practical <laughs> if you are just starting out I don't think a second employee needs to be the security guy but okay. what needs to happen is your first developer needs to have a security mindset your first IT hire that will probably happen when you are 10 to 25 people that needs to have some security background how do you quantify that like the security uh, mindset when you're hiring. So someone. that's a great question. <laughs> it's, it's not something I can like uh, like define qualities or something. But if you like for me, if I look at someone's code, the way they are writing it, they, the way they are documenting it, I can tell like it's just intuitive that this guy is thinking about security. Yeah. Uh, if you just talk to someone, like look, uh, ask them their priorities, uh, see how well tested their code is, uh, even the code syntax and everything, it will tell you uh, how serious they are about security. Uh, so yeah, your first developer have someone with a security mindset, uh, let them train others. Then your IT guy probably will be your next hire, uh, get someone with prior security experience, but doesn't need to be a dedicated security people. And then when you scale beyond maybe 20 people, that's when you should start looking into a dedicated security person for your role. Before that, just have internal people with security mindset plus hiring or uh, not hiring, but like just contracting external service companies to uh, provide you with security help. External companies, they don't only do audits, they will help you with uh, internal security as well. Uh, because the thing is, if your org is below 20 people, the security guy won't really be utilized fully unless you are someone like FTX with like 10, uh, 10x engineers just pushing the whole code out. Then it's a different story, but talking about normal logs, yeah, security people can come in a bit late. And Mudit, the, the 20 first metric, is that for projects at the application layer? Yes. Okay. Obviously, L2s and... I just want to chime different. in on that, yeah. that, the point that you made about, like, um, the security mindset. Like, what is the security mindset? Um, I think one reason why Web3 sort of struggles with this security mindset a lot of times is that we are like so generally optimistic and like visionary and forward thinking. And we are thinking about the potential and we are like thinking that nothing is impossible. And so, so much of our time is spent in this sort of idealistic future world that we're trying to build. And that's necessary. Like we have to be that in order to build these crazy things that we're building. Uh, however, um, like I would say that I have a security mindset, but I would also say that I don't spend most of my time thinking about like the potential of the future. I spend a majority of my time thinking about like how we're gonna fuck it up. Yeah. So that's so like the what, security mindset. On that right? note, how, how do you ensure compliance then? Right. I think it's something we had talked about before is like getting people to actually do the fundamentals, even simple things like MFA being enabled, right? Or um, Corey, we had talked about this. You know, endpoint detection and response actually being used, and if people aren't using that, then you kick them off the network. Like, how do you how do you get people to actually do the basics? So, like when we were starting up, right? Like, and I, I grew from me and my co-founder to twenty, and now we've got uh, like sort of over a hundred on the core team. Uh, we got like there's a thousand at consensus right now. Um, it's a uh, when we had like two people, three people, and started bringing people on, the thing that we did from the get-go was we, uh, we had good documentation about like what was required and what was expected of our employees. Uh, it talked about like what they needed to do and it need they needed to do it across like all of their accounts. Like there's no personal professional split in crypto. So 
like you have your personal Twitter, like that needs to be secured if you're gonna be a part of our company. Um, the other thing is a lot of these services like GitHub, you can force, like if you wanna be a contributor to my repo, like you have to have your MFA on. Uh, we bought everyone uh, multiple, like all the little hardware doodads, right? Everyone has a ledger, everyone has a Trezler, everyone has uh, all, the, all of them, the Google ones, the, 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 the yeah, the YubiKeys and the Google one, the Titan one. Oh, that that one, time, was, yeah. that one was pretty slick. Uh, still go back to my YubiKey all the time, though. Um, and these things, right, from the get-go, like, like the first employees, no matter what. Um, then, as you grow, you, like, your procedures are sort of in place. Um, but then your early employees also like, establish this like, floor of like, this is what's expected, right? And, and that's the culture. Like, that's how you establish the culture. Like, nobody is going to step out of line when it's already there. Right, and, and you call each other out. Like when you see someone being a little bit lazy, when you see someone doing something that's a little bit, you know. Even the founders, right? I mean, it starts oh, with yeah. the founders, honestly. I yeah. feel like, the, like the, the first security people that need to be hired are like literally the founders because like, I mean, they need to have like this adversarial mindset like from the get go, as Madrid was saying. It's like, I feel like almost like Web 2 versus Web 3 is kind of like the wrong kind of like comparison because like we're really and just, the, the business of um, security critical software. We had this conversation yesterday with Corey. It's like, you know, it's like everyone here is writing code. Like whenever we, you know, on-chain code is essentially like ring zero in a kernel. Like there is no safety net, you know, besides like whatever you're gonna put in place, essentially. No one is gonna do essentially like the security for you. And so it's just like coming with this adversarial mindset as a founder, just like thinking through like everything that is gonna go wrong. And just like Jay was saying is like the most important thing. So probably like starts from the top, the, the, the culture and the DNA of the company needs to be built around that. Like, there is no way for a company to be successful if they don't have that because, like, the, 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 the founders need to kind of be behind every single one of these decisions where, like, obviously security always comes at a cost of other things, right? Like, it's always the, 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 the security it doesn't live kind of, like, on its own, right? Like, in a corner. It actually always is a balance between, you know, convenience, like, you know, product features and, and like user experience versus, you know, the, the safety of, of doing these actions. So I think that like just uh, just having the founders uh, uh, kind of like come with this mindset like right away is the most important thing. Is this something that VCs in their due diligence process should include, like asking the founders about their views on security? Um, I think that like we don't want to be uh, too prescriptive about like the mindset that people have before uh, before initially like investment, but it's more like as soon as like we meet with them, we kind of like do the rundown of everything and we kind of like provide, you know, insight into all the threats that they're exposed to and kind of like try to really, if they don't have it already, like the, this mindset, uh, just make sure that like <laughs> after this con the, the first conversation, they already kind of like think about like everything that, that is going to go wrong because it's a, only a matter of time, right? Like you were saying, it's like, it's a matter of price and time mm -hmm. essentially. So... That's that's like how we how we approach this. Hmm. Interesting. Kind of switching from the project perspective to the user perspective, Mudit, you brought this up before. What do projects need to do to educate end users on their security hygiene? Yeah, exactly. So that's one thing this ecosystem needs to understand that uh, at the end of the day, security is really about users. Even if your protocol is secure, but nobody knows how to properly use it and everyone just keeps getting compromised, then you have failed. Like you create, uh, like you use the public private key architecture, but you never tell anyone how to secure their private key. Everyone just copy paste that on Google. Everyone gets compromised. You have failed your mission. So user education is super important. MetaMask here is doing a great job at it, but we need a lot more of it. And to get, yeah, and to get that, like we need to really understand, like in this space, we need to understand one thing that it, is uh, not always about getting the uh, like getting your mindset uh, very crypto focused or whatnot. You can be a crypto anarchist, but you have to be practical in the sense. Stop telling like sixty year sixty year old grandmas to manage their own keys. They are much better off using a custodial service. Uh, not your keys, not your coins. Everyone's favorite logo, but if you don't know how to manage your private keys doesn't matter if your key is yours or not, it will just get compromised. So unless you know what you're doing, it's often better to just go with a service product, just a custodial product, 
uh, rather than trying to learn what you don't know. Uh, this is why even in traditional finance, like earlier in the days, you saw like bonds and everything were paper based, but eventually everything got digitized and everyone just uses a custodian. Nobody really ever buys shares on anything directly anymore. Wherever you go, you are buying them through a platform, through a custodial platform, because TradFi has understand that it's, it's not it's like, if you want to scale, you can't ask everyone to just uh, manage their own keys or secure their whole things. You have to make it much easier. But what we in Web3, what we need to do is give users the choice. So if someone is tech savvy enough, if they want to run their own node, if they want to manage their own keys, uh, they should be able to do that. But we shouldn't be like shaming others for using Infura or other products or like using custodial products. We just have to change that mindset and educate people on both ends. I, uh, uh, so one thing I would add to uh, the UX, which 100%, it's, it's, UX is such a big uh, part of uh, security and helping people do the right thing. Uh, but I think uh, an underappreciated part of it, UX is um, uh, is that it's actually a um, you know it's a team game. It's it's every one of us in this room, every product, every project uh, that works in Web three. Uh, the, uh, the 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 UX is not just how good your UX is. It's how consistent is your UX with everyone else. Uh, you know the way users uh, the way they learn what is safe, what is unsafe is consistency. Uh, when they uh, that otherwise they have no prayer of going on. Uh, to a website and knowing if this is going to scam them or not because they're, they're going to have a whole new UX and every single time and maybe this website just does a little bit differently and they have no way of telling uh, just you know using your um, you know your lizard brain on in effect right when you're on that website uh, what you're what you should or shouldn't be doing um, you know I um, uh, my favorite uh, uh, example of this is uh, logging in uh, you know on a D app uh, you, you connect your wallet and you know some websites change and like start start treating, giving you data about like, you know, what's associated with your wallet. Uh, some don't yet, or they, they'll immediately challenge you. Some will let you click around and then you then challenge you. Um, and you don't, you don't have this concept of like, am I authenticated or am I not? Like how, how like where, where is that? What is it, what is expected of me? And all of a sudden you click something, you just this pop-up asking you to sign something. And you know, who knows what that something is? Hopefully it's signed with Ethereum, but you know. Um, and you know, compare that to uh, passwords. Uh, you know, users have, three decades of experience with passwords and knowing how to log into a website. It's consistent, every website's exactly the same. Uh, they, they know exactly what the experience is. They know what, they know what an authenticated state is versus an unauthenticated state. Like that is, you, 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 we are we're in ground zero with user education. And it's not just how good your product is, it's how good we can be as an ecosystem at being consistent and showing the same experience over and over again, teach users the right moments. Um, and I think that's something we really need to internalize and start pushing more as uh, standards. Yeah, I was just like, I was exactly actually what I was going to say, but I was also going to shill Taylor's project because they might not. Uh, if you want to look at good user documentation and education around every little thing, go to My Crypto's Facts and their like documentation. <laughs> it's so good because it like will walk you through like the mempool. It'll walk you through what a private key is. And all these other websites that are built on Ethereum assume prior DeFi knowledge, assume prior key management knowledge. And if you're really building for people outside of the ecosystem and including other crypto ecosystems that have dissimilar key structures and things like that, you should really spend just a little bit of time, invest in a tech writer, and or even just point to other people's pages that give that education for the users. And like if that sign like sign this message box pops up, I mean, there's so many people who don't realize that doesn't cost money. That is not a transaction that is signing a message from your public, from your key, key pair. So like, we're just so far behind in that because the protocol layer can't be the ones to teach that. Users aren't running CLI geth and learning that from scratch anymore. Uh, that's where I learned it, but that was way long ago where, where it's very different now. Uh, so yeah, just look at really good documentation and try to emulate that in your project. Yeah, I wanna emphasize like the amount of docs that I've written, but... <laughs> uh, it's worth it because um, you will be surprised at like how much people want to learn. And so like there's sort of like this track where like we can make the UX better and we can give users more choices that better serve them. Like we should definitely do all of those things. But if something is like the current way of doing it and it's not clear and it's not obvious, take that opportunity to tell the user, just like literally tell them, don't treat them like they're idiots. 
right? Treat them like they're smart, capable adults and tell them what's happening because they will carry that knowledge and then they will actually pass that knowledge along to other people. And it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. You would think like the docs I've written, like what, what, what comes of that? Nobody reads docs. Like it's weird when my words like show up in other people's like <laughs> tweets in other people's documents, right? People reference myself. Like I'm like, wow, there's people really reading this. Um, it's, it's amazing. I also want to say like back to what Corey was talking about. We do need to work together better. Uh, I'm told Nadav is in the audience. <laughs> Love you, Nadav. Nadav called us out recently. Like <laughs> now we're getting spicy. Finally, <laughs> OpenC called MetaMask out because there is so much user loss happening right now, um, and a lot of the user loss is actually literally with users of OpenC who are using MetaMask, and we should be working together better to. Uh, make sure that every single thing that we're doing and showing the users is uh, way clearer. And we should be in lockstep so that when OpenSea releases a new citing mechanism or a new way of handling something, MetaMask can actually, like, you know, not show gibberish. <laughs> Literally, not show gibberish, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> Anything but gibberish. Um, and so we have some, like, exciting things in the works that, like, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get into production soon that, that will ultimately serve not just MetaMask users, not just OpenSea users, right? It'll serve everyone in the ecosystem, but specifically right now, it will prevent the loss that we're seeing, and we are seeing an immense amount of loss. What, what's the way to solve that? Is it just point-to-point -point interactions between like the MetaMask and OpenSea, or do we need like industry working groups? I know, I know that's a can of worms. A lot of people don't like that concept. We have industry working groups. They fall off time and time again because yeah. the new shiny thing comes out. Make but... them DAO, tokenize them. <laughs> so, man, just like, that's just so meta to economically tokenize the incentives to economically tokenize right. the incentives to make layers. GitHub repositories of this layered yeah. protocol. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I... I, you might be able to answer better, Taylor, but all the groups I've seen, some of them have worked really great. Some of them floundered because the teams, especially the ones starting out, but who have a big impact, are small. They don't have the time to commit to going to a bi-weekly Zoom meeting to look into that. And then there's a lot of competing um, – what am I trying to say? There was like for a while there was even competing ERC standards, you know, a few years ago up until now with even – the basics of how we're doing messaging and signing of transactions across uh, Ethereum. It's a very interesting history to look back on, but uh, to fully answer it, I guess, yeah, just pretty much direct communication with the teams. Like if something's happening, just telegram them and then don't just leave them for a few days, like literally get back to them soon, especially if it's like money loss, security related, that kind of thing. That's where you need to have a dedicated person mm. who's doing at least security infra or CISO or whoever who could be like, oh, let me grab my lead dev. We'll fix this in 10 minutes. It all comes back to the point of someone on the team, hopefully from the founder side, to Naz's point earlier, has to own security, right? Yeah. One yeah. thing, I, uh, oh, good. Okay, one thing that I'd like to add is kind of like on this conversation, I think that like we should learn from a lot of the, the, the great kind of like uh, UX efficient security that like uh, that has been put out. I think that like Apple is probably like top, you know, like the the, the kind of like top company in in, in this space that like has been not in the space just like in the tech space in general uh, in terms of like uh, UX security. And you know, if you take something as simple, you know, I I, I used to work there and um, in the security team and kind of like saw a bit like the mindset from like internally. And you can see, for example, like you know. Um, Logging in, for example, like used to be like unlocking your phone used to be pin based, and you know we all know that like people just like hate to remember pin. So what did people do? You know when they were allowed to bypass it, they bypass bypassed it, right? And it was kind of like I think for only 14% of the people used to have uh, the pin on, and everyone else had just like the fully. Or even unlocked. before the passwords, right? Password you could used to be able exactly. to exactly one two three ABC or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then the moment they switched to face ID this stat actually rose to over 90%. So, you know, it, 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 like, if you're thinking about kind of like the mechanism to just like make security easy and just like flow with the, uh, the UX, people will just like come along with you in, in the process. And so I think that like, and again, we were discussing this with, with Corey yesterday, I think that like the, you know, the, the user interface can do a lot more for us as of today, you know. When we're thinking about, um, when we're thinking about making obviously like educated decision, you know, uh, MetaMask and, and other wallets are, are starting to, to, to put like great features in order to kind of like show you, you know, what are you essentially achieving by submitting this transaction to the network? What is, what is going to happen essentially uh, ahead of time? But something that is super interesting is like 
there is more to be done. You know, like you have uh, approvals for your NFTs. These are permissions, right? Similarly for like your uh, fungible token allowances that could be managed actually directly within the, the wallet. The wallet should be able to do that. Just like your phone actually manages your permissions, you know, like giving access to, you know, cameras and like Bluetooth and like location services and so on. Like all of these things are things that we can learn from just, you know, great user experiences on like, you know, mobile devices and so on. Uh, and, and I'm really hopeful that we'll, we're going to see more of these things as part of wallets. And similarly for like, you know, phishing, when we see like a lot of people that kind of like get scammed, sign the wrong like set approval for all and get kind of like all of their wallet trained, even kind of like wallet management should be possible like within the, within the wallet itself. Like, you know, think about, uh, you know, your wallet essentially just like spinning off, like, you know, generating a new address on the fly, uh, you know, providing essentially like allowing you to just like send funds, like minimal amount of funds to just like pay for the gas fees for the operation and not have access to any other asset that is part of kind of like your main address, right? Like just trying to think about like all of these things that don't necessarily need to show any complexity to you, the user, but just like help them in the journey, essentially of like keeping them. There's there. a startup doing that, right? Do y'all know about this? The, the, there's like a thing where when you launch a MetaMask transaction, there's a second window and it takes the bytecode and puts it into human English. So there's uh, yep. Hexagate that's working on that. There's a second one too. Uh, Redefine. Redefine. Yep. Yep. Blo yeah, maybe Blo Blowfish too. Blowfi yeah, Blowfish just raised. I think yeah. they do something. Stillo and other yeah. others, yeah. Yep. So something I would add, um, so 100% agree. Uh, I think all that stuff's amazing. And I think, um, you know, if we're going back to, you know, this whole thing started Web 2, right? Uh, I think one of the things we can also take away from the Web 2 world is like the depth of security controls that have been in implemented. Mm. Um, you know, no one is, um, you know, going back to right now, we're kind of running in ring zero. Um, and uh, when, you, when, you sign, when you sign with your wallet, um, you know, the equivalent of an operating system, like, um, you know, adding those kind of controls would be awesome ways to put some sandbox and some capability-based access controls and access reduction mechanisms. Um, but, you know, there's more to, um, uh, there's more layers we can add, right? Um, I think one of the biggest areas in my mind right now is, um, uh, and I, I've learned this from talking to victims of phishing attacks, is they, all, they often don't even know where they signed the malicious transaction at. Um, they, they're, they're at a loss. Um, and, um, that there's no introspectability. Uh, we're missing, um, you know, we're missing logs. We're missing, uh, and I think that we're also missing like a really like like key linkage for like on-chain and off-chain uh, transactions. So not only do we need monitoring logging on the project side, yeah, we need logging on the on the user side as the well. User side, yeah. yeah. We, we, if we're going to trust you, we're going to give, say your key, your your uh, your authority. You also owe. We also owe them every tool they need to be able to do that correctly. And that logging and monitoring is a big part of that. Yes. Um, <laughs> specifically, one thing that we've like experienced um, at MetaMask that OpenSea has called us out on and continues to call us out on is um, for the longest time there were transactions, and the transactions have like financial value, and it's pretty easy to like, you know, like teach users like this is a thing, and like there might be some bad things that happen depending on if you click this button, and then um, now a lot more stuff is just off chain. Right, or it's not on chain until after a certain period of time, if the order is matched or whatever, right? Um, and because of this like super early assumption that like everything is, there's a key and then you have transactions and the transactions go on a chain, because of that super early assumption that we made, uh, we did not see this coming, where now a, like just a signature, right? Just like an off chain signature can actually lose you like all of your NFTs or all of your tokens or allow permission somewhere else. Right? And so now we're like playing catch up while OpenSea is like sprinting ahead, <laughs> like making sure that it's usable, making things scalable. We're playing catch up to try to like map back. And like in reality, we should have never ever treated a transaction, like an on chain transaction signature, differently than a message signature. And because of that very early design choice, like at the core architecture level, we are now like remapping everything. And it's like, a, it's just a, it's a stupid amount of work to be honest, and it takes way longer than it should, and it's especially painful when users are losing money because of this every day, right? Like when we are hearing about celebrities losing their NFTs because of this thing that like we know should be better, that is, that's horrible. Um, I also wanna comment that like um, my talk tomorrow, I'm gonna be diving into like some of the early, early choices of like wallets, but also of the protocol itself, uh, and diving into like a lot of the stuff we're talking about here because I think that the, the biggest sin of it all is that it all traces back 
to this like private key, and this private key gives full authority over everything, right? Like that's the world that we've like like started with, and like fundamentally, it is so hopeless. Like it is so broken. Like why is this single thing that you can't change, you can't do anything with, the thing that grants like so much permission? And I think that like um, we are now seeing that like at the token level, we're trying to like implement permissions and restrictions. But ideally, like that would actually live like at, at the very core layer, right? Where like the first thing, the thing that holds your stuff is actually like a default, like you don't do anything. And the first thing you have to do is grant the permission and then you can take the action. Um, so yeah, come to my talk tomorrow. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into this. But you know, I think that this is why I really want to emphasize like have conversations with like the people that are around you, learn from your users, listen to them. Like the most valuable thing that I've ever done is have literal one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who've lost all their money. And like just ask questions and let them talk because you will learn so much about where your product is failing um, and you will be able to serve them so much better if you carry those stories with you. It's not super fun, but it is like the most valuable thing that I think I've ever done uh, to this day. I agree with that. Uh... On, on the bit that private key sucks, I completely agree. That refers back to the point I was saying, like, uh, theoretical security is one thing. Uh, people have built products that are secure in the best case, but if they are not practically secure, if nobody knows how to use their product, how, if nobody knows how to manage their keys and so on, you're just failing at your goal. And then the other thing on monitoring and alerting, that's another super important bit. So not just about users, but about, about your product as well. If your bridge loses 600 million, you shouldn't have to wait six days before you realize that. So <laughs> definitely always have... And that was because uh, of no monitoring. Yes. Yeah. Someone yeah. literally messaged them on Discord, hey, yeah. something's not right. So yeah. anyway, uh, you, should, <laughs> you should have yeah. proper alerting and monitoring. But yeah, also don't go too overboard. Don't start logging private keys of users. Uh, you have to find the right balance there. Uh, but <laughs> all of that aside, I want to like take a step back and like say we just like never talk really talked about the title, which is Web Two versus Web Three, same or different? Because I think we all just assume they are the same. Web Three just sprinkles a few things on top of Web Two security, but if it wasn't clear, like at least in my opinion, they are basically the same things. Spencer here has been trying to guide us towards. A bunch of, I think, 20 questions or something he prepared. Mm. If we have managed to get through maybe three till now, <laughs> just went on fun. <laughs> random yeah. spree. Yeah. But he has done a great job. Yeah, speaking of a curveball question, so uh, we were sharing war stories outside. Um, yeah, there's a reason why we're not going with the prep questions. Uh, so, Taylor, you were, you were uh, sharing one um, about incident response. Because, uh, you know, obviously, after you do monitoring the login, oh crap, something happened, right? Yeah. Maybe you were. Uh, you know, <laughs> what do you do next, right? So what are the lessons yeah. learned for that? So um, this space is decentralized, and a lot of the teams are therefore fully remote. Uh, we use Telegram, we use Slack, we use Discord, we use Signal, we use, like, there's, like, 8,000 chat apps. I don't know about you, but, like, for me, uh, my notifications are basically, like, off, because otherwise I'd just be, like, constantly inundated with information, and I wouldn't be able to think. Um, however, if something happens... Like, how do you let that person know that something happened? So, for example, this one time Hudson was giving a talk, uh, and he got sim swapped while on stage. Uh, and the sim swappers actually talked to his wife, uh, and I think told her that he was kidnapped because they're assholes, because they're sim swappers. Um, and because me and Hudson have like a relationship that goes back, and because Twitter like immediately alerted that Hudson was, uh, was sim swapped and was like DMing, asking for money. Because of that, like I had the actual sort of like in real life network and the actual phone numbers in place to be able to like contact, right? Same thing has happened with my own team. Like, I don't know, having each other's phone numbers and making like old school phone calls that break through like the do not disturb mode is like critical. Almost every single like incident response includes like tracking down the person who has the person's phone number, who has the critical access to stop the thing. Yeah, what? two things. Number one, I think both of you are on a list. So like, if I call you, I go through do not disturb mode, right? Exactly. Yeah, same here. So like, so how that set up? Yeah, we yeah. have that set up. Yeah. 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 So like, if one of us, because another time 
Someone posted something on my Twitter because I had like an API key out there. Anyways, the second thing is when I got SIM swapped and as soon as it got on there, I walked, I went back home when I was, everything was fixed. There were 10 very critical group chats that just said, Hudson SIM swap, don't listen to anything he said. Hudson SIM swap, don't listen to anything he said. And my startup at the time, Oak Innovations, immediately shut out all my access, cleared it, cleared it completely. The Ethereum Foundation in less than 10 minutes after the SIM swap happened, Clear, had a roundtable discussion, a live war room Zoom call, and got all my access taken away in minutes. Did you guys have a plan for that or just kind of spontaneous? Uh, we did have, so by that time, so I talked earlier about how not great the EF stuff was. By that time, we'd improved so much, we had a whole incident response plan ready for this for there the most go. part. Yeah. And we had a dedicated CISO role type deal that we have kept over years and years and years. And we have a great one right now who replaced me. Uh, after I left, or well, not before I left, before I left the EF and I was doing other things. But either way, yeah, that was one of the scariest things because like the cops were called, my spouse is crying. One more thing, and this is something just not related to this exactly, but um, something I'm really proud of Lilith for, my spouse. When I finally got a hold of her, the first person after resetting my passwords and I went to the, like, you know, the phone store, I called them and I said, hey, this is Hudson. And they were crying and they were like, I'm here with a police officer. I know this sounds like Hudson, but I'm going to give you two questions that only you would know. And I was like, thank you. I've taught you OPSEC. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, so that they knew it was me and everything worked out from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, like, really highlight one point uh, you had in there, which, uh, well, is, is, like, having the plan. Uh, but I think uh, a key is practicing the plan, mm. uh, you know, doing, doing ta uh, tabletop simulations, making sure that uh, uh, what, you know, documenting where the failures were, why, what was hard, and smoothing it over before you actually need to do it in, uh, in real life. Uh, I, actually, one of my favorite stories of this was uh, we had a simulation where we had to disconnect our corp from our prod network at a previous company. Um, and we had one room that we could get into, but that room kept getting smaller and smaller because, you know, we never need that room. Uh, and then when we, in our simulation, when we did, uh, we realized there's only one Ethernet jack, and we had no way of getting all of us into that room to be able to connect to Prod <laughs> and to keep it up, keep everything up. And then, like, so we're like, yeah, so it's just one of those, like, there's, it's, it's always the thing you don't think about that fails you um, in an incident, and you want to know that before you actually, before it counts. Some, something, uh, you know, sweat and training versus bleeding and war. Yeah. Yeah. Another, another thing I think that, like, uh, is important to, to take into account is that, um, a lot about um, incident response and like incident management is about time, right? Like time works against you. The person is, you know, someone or like some entity, some group already kind of like performed, like found the issue and kind of like tried to execute it. So your role is also to kind of like expand as much as possible the time window that you have where time can kind of work for you, right? It's kind of like, and, and, you know, we kind of like always discuss the, these things for like, you know, uh, uh, governance protocols and like, you know, uh, bridge security. It's, it's about like, you know, time locks and just like freezing funds for like spe specific amount of time so that like you actually give yourself some kind of like breathing rooms and kind of like your teams to kind of like go over the logs, go over like everything that happened, understand exactly like is, like is this something legit or not. If this is not legit, you know, obviously... If you have other mechanism in place, great. Otherwise, kind of like get ready for, you know, kind of like freezing assets across, you know, chains and so on. So I think that just like making time work for you is also one of the most critical things that you that you can do. And uh, a lot of people have been kind of like theorizing about this. Uh, it's um, how much time essentially like the uh, bad guys need to spend in your trenches um, in order to kind of like, you know, get the assets and then get, get away with it. So that's that's something that is very very important, and obviously, you know, uh, we'll never uh, emphasize enough the the need to kind of like you know baking time whenever you have like a new governance proposal, and just like uh, uh, whenever you have like specific thresholds or like limits that are hit, you know, making sure that um, these things like take time, and that you have like some some freezing periods where you can actually like, cancel uh, operations. And just want to hit on this point again. Uh, this is a this all the stuff layers together, right? You harden exactly. your systems, you make uh, you you make sure you patch systems as you find them, uh, and you audit them, and then but then whenever things do happen, you time box how long the attacker has in your systems that we have you can quickly respond. Like these all the stuff layers, and that's how you get a great security team. Defense in depth. Yep. On that one little bit. So with incident response, I agree. Time is very critical. So what everyone needs to do is have an IR plan, have a disaster recovery plans, literally have playbooks of every scenario you can think of anything that can go wrong have playbooks of what to do so that even if like 
you're out sick someday and some other security or someone else in the org who doesn't really know as much about the product can just see your playbook, follow the exact steps and be all good. Uh, and like you need to practice these playbooks as well. It's not just about having the content out there. You need to practice all of these playbooks and uh, everyone should be aware like what needs to happen, when needs to happen, how to follow the playbook. And only then you will be able to properly respond in a timely fashion. Uh, and another bit, I would say like coming back to the swim swap thing. So there I wanted to add a little thing. So with swim swaps, in fact, not just swim swaps, but any product where the support department of the company can uh, like do whatever with your access or wherever like you don't have control on your product, which is most of the web two products. Don't depend on either get something like highly secure or don't depend on the cheapest one. So for Sims, almost all of the public providers, like they can just sim swap any of their support engineer or uh, whatever can sim swap you. So never use mobile numbers for 2FA or recovery or anything permission. What do you think of Afani? That's the one uh, supposedly non sim swappable cell phone provider. I've not looked I mean, into them too much, but there are like a regulator. I mean, there are like legal requirements for them to like allow specific operations and like porting, you know, like your line to something else. So like, so long as like this operation is like required by law from, from these providers, there is an entry point, right? And mm. it's like, this is just like a matter of like how much social engineering you can do. Like uh, people were saying that like Google Fi was actually not seem swappable because there is no one to talk to on the customer service. Uh, but you know, it, it, it could happen, you know, like no one is kind of safe despite mm. because e even the more secure cell phone providers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, you want to aim for obviously, you know, the regular kind of like non SMS to FA based, but like if you're, if, if it is mandatory, go for like, you know, Google voice number, for example, like there's no SIM to swap essentially. So, you know, go for, for services that do not have like a SIM associated, associated to it. Yeah. And back to like the whole stack, right. And like layering this on top, right. Get the most secure SIM. And then have nothing like yeah, to exactly. have nothing on that sim, right? Or like only the 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 two services that like actually have to be on that sim, and like have that be a number that isn't really your primary number, right? Like all of these things layer, and like that's and then you're not signing what, up for like marketing databases with or anything. Do like not, that. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, for this conference, yeah. and this is like this is why we talk about like the culture, right? We talk about the organization, we talk about the people, and like how important that is from the ground up. It's like every little decision that you make has to be the most secure one, right? And so that you have all the different layers on top of each other so that it's less likely that things happen that are really bad. But even if those things happen, you can mitigate the loss, you can respond to the loss quickly. Uh, we are being... We're getting ushered <laughs> off the stage. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Love you all. Thanks everyone. <laughs>